The Kingdom Tales by David and Karen Maines. Book One Tales of the Kingdom. Episode Two The Orphan Keeper's Assistant. Once upon a time, the enchanter decreed that all who had disease or defects that could not be cured would be cast outside the city and left to die. All the unwanted and all the odd were cast out, and those who belonged to no one, except orphans. Orphans were kept because they were useful to the enchanter. In the blazing sun, a young woman picked her way across the garbage dump outside the enchanted city. She wore sunglasses, a wide-brimmed hat to cover her pallid skin, and a large round button that read, We Love Children, Orphan Keepers Association. She kept slipping on the mounds of garbage. Even behind sunglasses, her eyes were bothered by the light. Oh, whoops, down again. Watch out, light's white, she mumbled to herself. Smat, huffy puffy, garbage dumps and stuffy. Stained and filthy from her falls, she approached Stonegate entrance to Great Park. She thought she would rather do anything than go on this wild orphan chase. Miss a day's sleep, smudges. How was she supposed to get these gates open? She'd never been in this dreadful park before, but this was where the burners had said the orphans had gone. She rattled the iron gate, noticed a curling potato skin caught on her sleeve, and swept it away. She rattled again. Nothing budged. She tried to crawl over the gate, but her legs kept slipping and her button caught between the thin rails. Finally, she stood back and hollered, Does anybody hear me? Her hat bobbed back and forth. She shifted her bulging basket of a purse and shouted again, Does anybody hear me? No answer. She tried another idea. I am the Orphan Keeper's assistant, and the name of the Orphan Keeper, Open! I am hunting for orphans! The gates creaked open. She was impressed by the power of the name she had shouted, never suspecting for a moment that the gates always opened for hunters. Once inside, she followed a path, huffing and puffing all the way. Oh, what a jungle! All those trees! Better they were chopped down for fuel. What's all that noise? In the distance, she noticed a crowd of people in a large field. Some seemed to be dancing. A young man juggled several balls in the air. Then he dropped one. An older man was walking on a tightrope. All were working hard, but they were laughing and seemed to be enjoying themselves. <sighs> what a strange place! Orphan Keeper's assistant hurried on, ignoring brightly colored flowers waving on long green stems and majestic four-legged creatures, their ears poised to catch any sound. Thankfully, her eyes were shaded by sunglasses. She squinted behind them to keep out the bright light and this dreadful profusion of shape and color. Orphans were on her mind. Oh, bother! Orphans and outcasts! No sane person cared for either. She knew that better than others. Hadn't she been the daughter of an outcast before earning a useful place in the Enchanter's service? Nah, 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 the children of Enchanted City had teased when she was a little girl. Your mother's an outcast, an outcast, an outcast. Her mother had come down with an incurable disease, a malady called heart sickness, and had been cast out. Then when her father died, she had become an orphan. The double chin of the orphan keeper's assistant folded into her neck, and her shoulders shuddered at the memory. She hated outcasts. Nobody wanted an outcast. The path she followed led to the caretaker's cottage, all gingerbread trim and fieldstone. A young man, tall and handsome, stepped out the door just as she arrived. He was wearing a long navy cloak with a silver clasp on the shoulder. She knew from her training that it was the uniform of a ranger, one of the many watchkeepers for the man who called himself the king. Can I help you? the man asked. His eyes twinkled with light, though his lips were unsmiling. You certainly can, you nice thing you, giggled the orphan keeper's assistant inwardly. But she said, smuts and smudges! Get me out of this light! I'm a perfect puddle in the heat! Is caretaker home? And what's mercy? See mercy, the orphan keeper said to be. Get orphans from Mercy! Ranger took her bulging purse, held the door, and explained. Mercy is caretaker's wife. Caretaker is not here today. Step inside. 
Mercy, someone from the Orphan Association. The Orphan Keeper's assistant took off her sunglasses. She saw an old woman standing in front of the fire, older than anyone she had ever known. The elderly lady was stirring the contents of a pot over the fire in the hearth. She wore a long blue cotton dress, covered by an apron pinafore. Tendrils of white hair curled and felled beneath her snood. She turned and smiled at the visitor, and all the wrinkles on her face creased upward. Welcome, Hunter, she said. I am Mercy, caretaker's wife. We are servants of the king. The hand she extended in welcome to her visitor was as smooth and unaligned as a girl's, and her back was straight. Odd, the orphan keeper's assistant thought. Mercy seemed both very young and very old. The orphan keeper's assistant felt nervous and confused. Keep your eye on the odd ones. Be official, she chided herself. She heard the orphan keeper's warning. Bring him back alive. If you fail, you'll have a burner on your tail. I am the orphan keeper's assistant, she announced loudly, hoping everyone in the room would be impressed. She hooked a thumb under her official button and pushed it out from her blouse. Opening her basket, she produced a signed document. I have a warrant for errands here, signed by the orphan keeper herself. Two runaways last seen at Stonegate entrance. One called Scarboy. Her eyes were beginning to adjust to the dim light inside the cottage, and what she saw astounded her. Two girls cleared dishes from the extended table, feeling the surface with their hands, counting with their fingers. They were blind. Skinny sticks of children ran in and out. Who would want such skeletons? Orphan Keeper's assistant thought. Three children were playing a game on the floor, one with crutches, one not moving. What kind of a hole is this? Who wants outcasts? Yuck! Then she spotted two boys who stood in a corner. They moved away from her gaze. The older one hid his cheek behind his hand and held the young one tightly with his other hand. There they were! The young ranger made a motion. Excuse me, Mercy, but I must keep watch. Will you need anything? He asked, glancing at the woman. But the caretaker's wife shook her head. With a sweep of his cloak, he was out and gone. Fool! thought the orphan keeper's assistant. Do you think this old ditty is a match for me? She was sorry to see him go. She needed a little romance in her life. An assistant got sick and tired of orphan roll calls, orphan head counts, orphan work shifts, orphan manuals. Who needed another orphan hunt? The Enchantress Dagoda was hardly the place for such a sentimental creature as she. She often dreamed of a nice young man saying, Orphan keeper's assistant, you are my heart's desire. The boy in the corner glared at her. She glared back, then said, Shoo! It's hot! Hot, I'll say! She took off her sweater. She plopped on a chair and rolled down her heavy stockings. She wiped her face with a large bandana she had taken from her basket. She lifted her hat. A rotten tomato fell to the floor. Someone giggled. You'll get yours, you'll get yours, thought the orphan keeper's assistant. But out loud, she said, Whose children are these? They can't all belong to you. Mercy smiled again, the wrinkles creasing upward. They are mine, she said, looking the young woman straight in the eye. They're all mine. We have no orphans in Great Park. Everyone here belongs to someone else. Everyone here belongs to someone else? The orphan keeper's assistant had never heard such a silly claim. If she could not prove the two children were orphans, she would have to snatch the runaways and escape quickly. When Mercy seated herself at one end of the long table in the room, the orphan keeper's assistant made her move. She ran to the boys, cringing in the corner, scooped Little Child under one arm and grabbed Scarboy's hand with the other, and dashed for the door. But try as she might, orphan keeper's assistant could not drag Scarboy out the door of Caretaker's cottage. She tugged and pulled, she huffed and puffed, smats and smudges! Finally, she gave up and looked quizzically at Mercy. We have no orphans in Great Park, Mercy repeated. These children belong here. You cannot take them unless they leave willingly. Willingly, eh? A gleam appeared in the eyes of Orphan Keeper's assistant. You're too old, she said to Mercy. You're too old to stop me. It was a challenge. The two boys moved quickly back into the far corner. 
Orphan Keeper's assistant settled herself at the opposite end of the table from Mercy. She placed her elbows on the tabletop with her chin in her hands. Mercy took the same pose. The two women's eyes locked. Everyone in the cottage became still. What was happening? Who would win? Why, oh, why had the strong ranger gone away? In the corner, the scar boy and little child held each other tightly. The orphan keeper's assistant spoke first. By the orphan keeper, by scars and mars, by pain and sadness, ills and madness, by orphan keeper, orphan keeper, you do not belong to mercy or anyone else. Now pains long forgotten by the children in the room were remembered. The boy in the wheelchair hunched and whimpered. The blind girls bumped into each other. One dropped a dish. One snarled, another child scratched. The lame child turned his back on his partners. Mercy looked the orphan keeper's assistant straight in the eye. She answered her spell. Caretaker, caretaker, caretaker's wife. Whose are these? They are mine. They are mine. Caretaker, caretaker, caretaker's wife. Mercy lifted her face from her hands, never taking her eyes from her opponent's face. She threw her arms wide as though she would enclose the whole room. Things are not what they seem, she cried. Things are not what they seem. In Great Park, we know this to be true. The boy in the wheelchair straightened his back. The pain was gone once more. He held his head high. The blind girls helped each other sweep up the broken dish. One whistled a little song. The child with crutches scooted over to his friend. Someone laughed. Two of the skinny children ran out to play. Orphan Keeper's assistant was sweating profusely now. Driblets of water ran down her face. Blats and smats! She'd be fired for sure! Burned by burners. Where did Mercy's strength come from? The Orphan Keeper's assistant made fists of her hands and jammed them down hard on the tabletop. Ordinary orphan hunt! Ha! This is not ordinary at all! Lousy Orphan Keeper! Should have come herself! She pinned her mind to the boy standing in the corner. Scarboy, Scarboy, come, come, she thought. By the death drums, the fire priests, by the fire robe. I'll make you come willingly. Over and over she concentrated on Scarboy's name. But the work was hard. Then she noticed the boy take a step out of the corner. She saw him let go of his brother. Scarboy, Scarboy, come, come. It would only be minutes before the boy was at her side. Suddenly, the orphan stiffened. My name is Hero, he asserted. Hero? Hero who? Orphan Keeper's assistant responded to the boy's defiance. That's not your name. Never. Who ever heard of an orphan named Hero? Quickly, the young woman increased her concentration. She felt the room tilt toward the door. She called in her mind, Scarboy, come, come. Slowly, the boy took another step. Now, now is the time. Call out the names. The young woman rose to her feet, still gripping the edge of the table, her back bent, her eyes pinned to Mercy's. Her voice was shrill. I am the Orphan Keeper's assistant! In the name of the Orphan Keeper, by the name of fire priests and burners and breakers and naysayers, in the name of the Enchanter, I command all who belong to that burning one to come to me! <laughs> the children whimpered. Scarboy began to walk toward the Orphan Keeper's assistant, his eyes dazed, his steps wooden. He dropped his hand, the raw and ugly scar showed on his face. Beads of sweat stood out on Mercy's wrinkled forehead. The white hair beneath her snood was damp, but she smiled. She gripped her end of the table. She kept her eyes locked with those of the young woman. She rose from her seat. She commanded, I am Mercy, wife to the caretaker of Great Park. In the name of the Ranger Commander, protector and keeper of the watch, in the power of the sacred flames, by the name of the King, son of the Emperor of all, who will bring the restoration of the kingdom, I forbid, I adjure, I prevent. The house tilted back again. The boy stepped back toward the corner. Mercy lifted her hands above her head. She clasped them together. To the king, she shouted. To the kingdom, to the restoration. 
the Orphan Keeper's spell was broken. The children sighed. Mercy slumped. Protection closed over them again. The assistant dropped her eyes. A small wail came from her mouth. Oh me. Oh my. Find mercy, said the orphan keeper. I found mercy, but mercy hasn't done me. I'll get fired. I'll get fired. The orphan keeper's assistant put her face in her hands and wept. She wailed something pitiful. She blubbered and hollered. She pulled a handkerchief from her basket to wipe her face. Gently, a tiny hand patted her arm, touched her shoulder, wiped her tears away from her cheeks, then her eyes. It was one of the blind girls. The child, smelling of lavender and soap, pressed her cheek against the cheek of the orphan keeper's assistant. Opening her eyes, the young woman discovered that she was surrounded by the children. The boy in the wheelchair offered a cool cloth damp and fragrant, to press against her hot forehead. The child on crutches had poured a drink and held it out to her. One of them said, Don't cry, Orphan Keeper's assistant. Don't cry. But she cried all the more. Who had ever spoken so kindly to her? Her father had died in the Bellows Works beneath the city, and her mother had been an outcast. Then the two boys standing near the coroner came forward. The older spoke to Mercy. I will go back with her. Little child can stay with you. Firing is terrible. No one should be fired because of me. Orphan Keeper's assistant wailed. She remembered branding. Her hand felt sore at the memory. She was only Orphan Keeper's assistant because she served Orphan Keeper and the Enchanter without question. Not because they cared for her. She had no friends. But Mercy had said... Everyone here belongs to someone else. The children patted her hand. Mercy cleared her throat. <clears throat> I think I have a happy ending. Why doesn't the orphan keeper's assistant stay? That way, Hero won't have to go back, and she won't have to be fired. The children danced and jumped. Yes, stay! Stay, orphan keeper's assistant! Stay with us! Please, please, we want you to stay! The orphan keeper's assistant blew her nose. She sniffled and snuffled. She looked at Mercy. The young woman's eyes were full of wonder. You want me? She asked, amazed. I have a confession to make, said Mercy. It was I who called you from the orphan keeper. I willed you across the garbage dump to Stonegate entrance. I wanted you here. I think you will be very good with the children. Stay, said the blind girl, pleading. We don't want you to be fired. Live with us. You'll love the king. You can live with us. <laughs> Hurrah, cried the lame child. He waved his crutch in the air, tottering off balance and almost fell. But the orphan keeper's assistant reached out and caught him. Caught him. But why, stammered the young woman, why? Mercy picked up the spoon to stir the pot on the fire. One more person to love, I guess. Just one more person to love. Orphan Keeper's assistant blew her nose. She wiped her face with a damp cloth. <laughs> old woman, she said. You're no old woman. That's the truth. Mercy laughed. She walked over to the chair where the young woman sat. She put her arms around her and said, I told you, things are not what they seem. And so the hunter stayed, because she found the orphan she had been seeking, herself. She discovered that the kingdom was for outcasts, and one must become an outcast in order to follow the king.